All right, I'm ready for that smoke. Okay, so Deliverance Ministries will not be happy with me making this video because I'm about to expose one of their sacred false doctrines that they use as a fear tactic to keep many less mature Christians afraid, living in fear, and completely dependent upon them to cast a demon out of them. So if you're not aware, there is a very dangerous false teaching that is being promoted by many from the Deliverance Ministries camp called the Spiritual Spouse Doctrine or Night Demons or they're referred to by a few different names. And what I wanna do in this video is I want to expose it completely for what it is, a false doctrine. So three things I wanna do in this video. Number one, I wanna explain to you very clearly what this doctrine that they are promoting what it means, what they are suggesting, a spiritual spouse, spiritual husband, spiritual wife, night demon, goes by very different, various different names. The second thing I wanna show you is literally just how crazy they twist the scriptures, taking scriptures, ripping them out of their context, horrible exegesis, horrible hermeneutics to try to push their point across, to try to force some sort of idea of a spiritual spouse into the scriptures, and then the third thing I wanna do is I wanna share with you why it is so problematic for you to continue following some of these people who have large followings on and offline, specifically as they continue to push this type of false doctrine. But stick around to the end of this video because in spite of all the things that I'm gonna share with you in this video about this concept or doctrine of spiritual spouses, I'm gonna share with you in spite of all that why I do believe in the doctrine of spiritual spouses. Stick around. Okay, so question number one, what is a spiritual spouse? Well, those from the deliverance ministry camp would have you to believe that there is such a demon, a night demon, that will come and visit you in your dreams and marry you or espouse you or oftentimes even molest you or violate you in some way, causing all sorts of problems in your life because now that spirit is now attached to you, that spirit is now married to you, that demon is now married to you, and as a result, that demon is very, very jealous, and so that demon is going to cause all kinds of problems in your marriage because that demon who you are spiritually married to because that demon has visited you in your dreams and has caused all sorts of havoc in your life through your dreams does not want you to be happy in your marriage. And so that demon is going to try to cause problems in your marriage because that demon is jealous of your relationship with your husband. Also, that demon might, if you're a single woman, and it's also for men as well, but it seems like more women are falling for this. But if you are you're a single woman, that demon has married you, has attached himself to you, causing you to have all sorts of uh, wet dreams and sexual dreams and these types of things. You wake up and you, you feel like literally that you've actually had a physical encounter with this demon, your spiritual husband, and, and that demon is jealous. And so that demon is now blocking you from having a relationship with other men because that demon wants you all to himself. And the only way to get free from this is to go visit the man of God and have the man of God lay hands on you, pray over you so that you can get delivered from your spiritual spouse. Or maybe if you are a man and you're struggling with uh, watching inappropriate websites or masturbation or all, any sort of lustful thing, no, that's not your sinful nature. No, 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 that's a demon you have a lustful demon on you. It, it's 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 a it's a night demon. It's it's a uh, a spiritual wife that that has attached uh, herself to you, and she's causing you. It's not you lusting. She is causing you to lust, and you need to go to the man of God so that you can get delivered from this spiritual wife. You can tell I'm fired up about this video, can't you? So once again, if you go to any of your favorite. Deliverance ministers online, I am not gonna call them out by name, but quite frankly, you can go to any of their channels and just type in spiritual spouse and you will probably find several videos where they are gonna try to brainwash you 
but don't let them do it. Don't fall for it, okay? Read your word and follow the things that I'm gonna share with you in this video. I want you to watch this video all the way through, and then I want you to watch some of their videos and see which one makes more sense. So with that out of the way, let's move on to the second thing that I wanna cover in this video, and that's probably the most important, which is how are they taking these scriptures ripping them out of their context and twisting them to try to convince many Christians who are less mature, who don't really know their word very well, to try to convince them that they have been possessed or influenced or demonically uh, affected by some sort of night demon. Well, we're going to go from the, the simplest one all the way to the one that they like to use the most. All right, so the first one is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 34, verse 14, which says this. Desert animals will mingle there with hyenas, their howls filling the night. Wild goats will bleat at one another among the ruins, and night creatures will come there to rest. Now, there it is, right? So take this one verse, rip it out of its context, and develop an entire theology on this concept of spiritual spouses, spiritual demons, because of the phrase night creature. Now, they will say that in the Hebrew, the phrase night creature is the word Lilith, and they say, oh, well, you know what? Uh, Lilith is a sexual uh, demon, right? Well, there's some problems with that. First and foremost, if you take this verse, put it in its context, I don't have time to go through it in this video, but just go read it for yourself after this video is over. And you will see that the context here is talking about what is going to happen to the nation of Edom and how the nation of Edom is going to be destroyed and the land is going to be um, uh, emptied and, and the land is going to basically be devastated and the things are going to be left behind or wild goats and different things like that and this night creature. That's the first thing. All right. Now, the second thing is in order for you to jump all the way from the phrase night creatures to this concept of Lilith being a sexual being, you have to go outside of the Bible because this is the only reference in the entire Bible that you see the Hebrew word Lilith, and you have to actually borrow from Babylonian mythology. So if you wanna get your theology from Babylonian mythology, which is the belief that Lilith is some sort of night creature, some sexual demon, be my guest, right? Another issue that we have here is the fact that, once again, this is only mentioned once in the entire scripture. So why would you wanna build an entire theology on one verse that is in many ways confusing? Another thing, if you look at the King James, it interprets this as screech owl, right? Screech owl, or the ESV, I believe, refers to it as a night bird, right? So clearly these other translations are understanding this isn't some demon, this is an actual animal, right? Maybe a nocturnal animal that dwells in the night. But the deliverance ministers will have you to take this verse and try to prove to you that, oh, because you see that phrase, that means there's a spirit. There's a spiritual husband, spiritual wife that is going to visit you at night because the phrase says night creatures. So that must be a night demon. Now, that's just the first passage. I've got two more passages of scripture that I'm going to show you how they embarrassingly twist the scriptures to try to push this doctrine of spiritual spouse. And the second one is really, really sad. It comes from Matthew chapter 13 and uh, verse 30, excuse me, verse 25, and it reads this. But that night, see, notice the phrase night. Oh, so it must be talking about a night creature. As the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. So, oh, see, there you go. The enemy plants things in your life at night while you sleep. Now, guys, this is really horrible hermeneutics. If you look at the context of this verse, this verse is within the context of Jesus' famous parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds. And the concept is that there was a farmer who sowed, right, sowed some seed and up grew wheat. Wheat is good. Wheat represents Christians, right? But then, as the workers slept, an enemy crept in and sowed some seeds, and out, uh, up came weeds. Weeds represent non-Christians. And one of the guys who's working the field says, hey, do you want me to go in and tear up those weeds? And the guy says, no, 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 don't do that. Because right now, the wheat and the weeds are the same height. They're growing the same. You can't tell the difference between wheat and weeds because at this point, they look the same, which is a commentary oftentimes between even though there are righteous people called Christians and there are unrighteous people uh, in God's sight called uh, non-Christians, 
Sometimes they look the same. And so it's not for us to judge and say, oh, well, you're a weed and you're a weed. So what does the parable say? The parable says, wait for a time and then the wheat will continue to grow. The weeds will not. And then it will become clear which ones are wheat and which ones are weeds. And then at that point, the farmer who owns the land is going to take the weeds out because now he is the only one who can distinguish between the two and he's going to throw them and they're going to be burned into the fire on judgment day. So what is this passage talking about? It ain't talking about a demon. It is not talking about any sort of night creatures or spiritual spouses of any kind. This is talking about judgment at the end times when God is going to separate the wheat from the weeds. That's what it's talking about, all right? So let's not try to force things into the scripture because we feel like, oh, I need to have some scripture so people will believe that what doctrine I'm pushing is actually true. So let me force it. That's called eisegesis, not exegesis. Exegesis is when you're letting the scriptures speak for themselves. Eisegesis is when you try to push your idea and force it into a text that doesn't say what you're trying to make it say. So to sum up, this passage has absolutely nothing to do with demonic spirits coming to visit you while you dream, having sex with you with or without your consent. Are you kidding me? This passage does not say anything to that sort. Now let's look at the final most popular passage that many ministers from the deliverance ministry camp will use to try to swindle, to try to bamboozle you into thinking that you might actually have a spiritual spouse. It's in Genesis chapter six. We're gonna read two verses, verse two and verse four. Notice it says this, the sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives. And then continuing on in verse four, it says this, in those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth for whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. So from this passage and a few others that I'll mention in just a moment, many have concluded or developed this doctrine that angels had cohabited with women by taking on the form of a male body. They possessed actual men, and these actual men had intercourse with these women. And because these men were uh, essentially inhabited by a demon, they had supernatural genes. And so the offspring of these demonically possessed men and these women were these giants called the Nephilites. And this is one of the reasons why God had to wipe out the entire race with the flood and start all over again, because this was a demonic attempt to try to infiltrate or pollute, if you will, the lineage of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have time in this video to talk about whether or not that is the proper interpretation, but I do have an entire other video where I talk about that. Uh, you can watch that here up on the screen, or you can click the link in the description box below. But let me give you a few reasons why it is very troublesome to use this passage of scripture to build a theology about having a spiritual spouse. First and foremost, this passage is heavily debated in various circles as to what it means. Now, some people will say, oh, yes, you know what? Uh, indeed, this does mean that demons, because the phrase sons of God in other passages of scripture, and particularly in Job, uh, refers to uh, angelic beings. And so they'll say, oh, well, you know, this must be uh, demons. Okay, cool. Others will say like, you know what? No, 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 that can't be the case. Now, if you believe that they are, well, you know what? Let me come back to that. All right. So the first reason is if Let's just say that you believe that this is meaning what it says. You have to at least on the surface say that this is a very confusing passage of scripture. So why would you want to build an entire theology on a passage of scripture, which we can all agree is very, very confusing because of the phrase sons of God. What does that mean? Does that mean men? Does that mean demons? What does it mean? It's confusing. All right. Now, the second reason to say, okay, you know what? Let's just for the sake of argument, assume that this is true because there are other scriptures that you can go to. For instance, Jude verse six, which says this. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. So this is referring, some people believe, to these demonic spirits who left their rightful place 
and cohabited with these women through the bodies of these men. Stay with me. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. Now, you also have to combine this, Jude 6, with 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, which also says this, For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. All right, that could be a reference to these demonic spirits. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. So this is the second reason why you should not be using this passage to teach spiritual spouses. It's because, guys, listen, God put an end to this. God put an end to the possibility of a demon to cohabitate in a man's body and have sex with a woman. God locked all those demons up and basically say, you know what? This ain't happening, all right? This isn't happening anymore. So much so that these demons are being kept in a special place. They're not even free to torment people because what they did was so against the code of God that God said, you know what? I'm not even gonna let you free. I'm gonna keep you locked up in chains of judgment until the day of judgment. But the third and final reason, guys, that this is a horrible way to teach this idea of spirit spouses is because, guys, listen, what happened in this story if you assume it's actually talking about uh, demonic spirits? What happened was these demons actually took on the form and infiltrated a actual male body and that male had actual physical intercourse with these women, not through the dreams. It wasn't fake believe. It wasn't a thought. No, it was actual physical act. How do we know? Because the Bible says they had offspring. I don't know about you, but I don't think anybody in the history has ever gotten pregnant from a demon in a dream. I don't think you can get pregnant in a dream. It ain't happening. It doesn't matter how real it seems to feel, it ain't happening, right? So the deliverance ministers will use this passage of scripture, which is clearly talking about a physical union between a demonically possessed man and a woman. And they will say, oh, well, we, you know, we can use this to develop a theology that there must be a demon that visits you in your sleep, in your dreams, and has spiritual intercourse with you. Guys, the reason why I'm yelling and screaming in this video is because I'm tired of this stuff. I, I am so fed up and tired of seeing all of these hundreds of thousands of views on these videos, and I don't even care about the views, I care about the souls, I care about you, I care about all these hundreds of thousands of people that are being led astray to think that because they had a dream or something like that, and because somebody uh, twisted the scriptures, that, that, that now somebody's convincing you that you have to get delivered from this demonic spiritual spouse. Guys, I have shown you very clearly how these passages that they would like to use are completely ripped out of their context. And nowhere in the entire Bible do you see a clear concept or teaching of this idea of a spiritual spouse. You won't find one. As a matter of fact, don't quote me on this, but I would even go as far as to say, if you look back through church history, will you ever see any time in church history where anybody was being, uh, any spiritual spouse doctrine was being presented or teach? This is a relatively new thing that's kind of hit the scenes, uh, you know? So just be careful, as the Bible says, not to be deceived by clever doctrines and philosophies of human origin. Now, let's move into the third reason, a third thing I want to talk about in this video, and that is the fact that why is this so problematic? Okay, problem number one, and I've referenced this already a few times, but it's just unbiblical. You won't find it in the scriptures. And this idea, guys, that you can have a spiritual spouse. Now, let's, let's, let's just look at that phrase. Really? You can be married to a demon? <laughs> what does the Bible say about demons and angels? Well, it says this in Mark 12, 25, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. What does the Bible say about angels? They don't marry. Demons, they don't marry. Now, they could take on a form of a man, right? Like they did in Genesis 6, if that's your interpretation. But the spirit in its essence doesn't marry. And what? But once again, what does the Bible say about marriage? What did Jesus say? Marriage is between what? A male and a female. And, and they shall leave their father and mother and cleave unto their husband or wife. And the two shall become one. The Bible in nowhere does it teach that a human can be married to a demon. It doesn't teach that. So that's the first thing. It's unbiblical. The second problem, guys, is that it 
misplaces the blame. See, so if you have a lustful thought or you're struggling with lust, oh, they'll have you to think that's not you. That's the demon in you. Oh, no, that's not your sin nature. That's the demon in you. And so you need to come to me and maybe even give an offering while you're there. But you need to come to me and you need to get delivered from this demon of lust. Guys, the Bible is very, very clear on how you and I should handle our spirit, our sinful nature. It's very clear. It doesn't say go get delivered from a demon. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say that. It tells us exactly how to handle our sinful nature. Notice it says in Romans 8, 13, for if you live by its dictates, you would die. But if through the power of the spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. He says it's your responsibility and my responsibility to mortify, to put to death the deeds of our own sinful nature. Paul says what I die daily to my flesh. He doesn't say I'm going to go and get delivered from a demon. Nowhere does it say that. And also, what does it say in Galatians chapter five? It says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. It doesn't say, so go and get delivered from a demon whenever you have sinful thoughts. It doesn't say that anywhere in the New Testament, although they'll have you to believe that's the solution for you to get all of your problems wiped away. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. You know, this reminds me of an old saying that I heard growing up that says this, two natures beat within my chest. One is foul and one is blessed. The one I love and the one I hate, but the one I feed will dominate. Listen, that is so true. If you feed your sinful nature, it's going to dominate you which is why you have to be intentional about feeding your spirit on a daily basis, which leads me to the third and final thing that's problematic about this, and that is the idea that it really is a misunderstanding of dreams and how dreams work. All of our the scientific data points to the fact that we dream about things that we think about throughout the day. If you have a thought, if you're interested in somebody's husband that's not your own and you're fantasizing about that person, you might have a dream about them. Or if you're watching movies online that are inappropriate, you might have a dream that night. It doesn't mean you have a demon. It means you need to control the thoughts that are coming through your mind so that your dreams won't be tormenting you. Guys, I am so sorry for the yelling and the screaming, but I, I'm, I, just, I just can't. I cannot, I love you all too much to let you be uh, continually uh, led astray by some of this false doctrine, this foolishness. It's literally foolishness that's being ripped out of the scriptures and leading many people to believe that this is the solution for them, all right? Now, with all that out of the way, I told you earlier that with all of that, I still do believe in the doctrine of spiritual spouses. You wanna know what it is? You know what? A spiritual spouse ain't no demon, excuse my language. A spiritual spouse is a spouse who is led by the spirit of God. You want to be a spirit. I want to be, a, I'm a spiritual spouse. I want to encourage you to be a spiritual spouse. Don't let any deliverance ministry take the phrase spiritual spouse and demonize it as if it's something negative. No, it's something positive. A spiritual spouse is a spouse who has made up their decision that they are going to love their God first and foremost with all their mind, heart, strength, and they're going to love their husband or their wife in a way that honors God being led by the Spirit. So in conclusion, is the enemy trying to attack you through a spiritual spouse? No. But could the enemy be using this false doctrine of a spiritual spouse that is being promoted by many in the deliverance ministries to try to convince you that you don't need to go to marriage counseling. You don't need to work things out with your spouse by biblical principles. You don't need to get your lustful thoughts under control. You don't need to do any of those things. You just need to come and see the man of God so they can cast out a demon and you can get delivered. In that way, the enemy may be attacking you. So that's the reason why I made this video to try to expose that false doctrine so I can set you free from believing in this foolishness so that you can no longer be led astray by this weak fear tactic that many people are using to keep you dependent upon them so that they can cast the demon out of you. Don't get fooled. Do your homework. Study the scriptures for yourself and always make sure that you put scriptures in context. Grace and peace, fam.